Welcome to the Compounding Center Connections, where we talk about different health conditions with our partnered practitioners. I'm your host, Jay Gill, a compounding pharmacist from the Compounding Center in Leesburg, Virginia. At the Compounding Center, we collaborate with practitioners, create custom medications to help our patients get better. We not only compound for humans, but we also compound medications for small and large animals. So in this episode, our guest is Dr. Bill Tyrell from CVCA in Leesburg, Virginia. Today's talk is on heart disease in pets, how to recognize symptoms of heart disease and what treatment options are available. So I'm very excited to have Dr. Bill Tyrell join us today. Before we get started, Dr. Tyrell, would you please introduce yourself? Sure thing. Well, first off, thanks for having me. I really, really sincerely appreciate and look forward to the next next half hour or so. But um, as Jay said, I'm Bill Tyrell. I'm a veterinary cardiologist. I'm a graduate of the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine uh, at Downer Virginia Tech. I did my I when, upon graduation. I spent four years in in general practice in Fairfax, Virginia, before going back for my residency in cardiology up in Boston, Massachusetts, at the world famous Angel Memorial Animal Hospital, a practice that has about a hundred veterinarians and, and hundreds of support staff. So that's where I did most of my cardiology training. Came back to the Northern Virginia, suburban Maryland area, and joined. Um, CVCA Cardiac Care for Pets, formerly Chesapeake Veterinary Cardiology Associates, and have become a co-founder of their, their practice. I primarily work out of our Leesburg, Virginia location, out of the Life Center, uh, but CVCA Cardiac Care for Pets um, has now 16 offices um, spanning Virginia, Maryland, uh, Kentucky, Texas, wow. and Oregon, uh, soon to be in North Carolina, Massachusetts, and California. So we, we continue to grow uh, across the country. Um, my primary research interests are, are giant breed cardiomyopathy or heart disease in large breed dogs, along with the development of an arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. So that, that's a little bit about me. I didn't know there were that many CVCA uh, uh, sites around the country. We are, we continue to grow. So we have, I think, 34 cardiologists at this point in time, some, something wow. like that. I've lost track. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, quick disclaimer before we get started. Uh, the information discussed today is for informational purposes only, not for diagnosis or treatment. So, um, so, so Dr. Tyrell, tell us what is heart disease and the cause of heart conditions in cats and dogs? Sure. So, so when we think of heart disease in humans, we, we usually think of coronary heart disease, coronary artery disease. And I'm sure all of us have had a friend or a family that, that's had a, a heart attack per se. And for the most part, that's what we think of on the human side causing heart disease. And in fact, in animals, both dogs and cats, it's extremely rare for them to have um, coronary artery disease. So when we talk about heart disease in, in dogs, we talk about primarily two different things. I already mentioned cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy is our, our sort of fancy doctor word for, for disease of the heart muscle. So we can have in, in usually large breed dogs, and it does affect sometimes in small breed dogs. And we'll talk, talk about that a little bit later on in the, in the podcast. Um, dilated cardiomyopathy affects the heart muscle, primarily affecting the left ventricle. So what happens is the muscle tends to thin out and it loses its overall pumping action. So instead of the heart contracting very forcefully, it's just kind of sitting there like a flaccid water balloon would. And then in dogs, we also see a tremendous amount of what we term degenerative valve disease. It's, it's very, very common, primarily in small breeds of dogs, for these patients to develop um, a degeneration of the mitral valve. The mitral valve sits between the, the left atrium on the top of the heart, left ventricle on the bottom of the heart. And with age, um, there, there's reports of up to 90% of small breed dogs that develop some form of degenerative change to the mitral valve. So the mitral valve no longer has a tight seal across it. We end up with a back leak of blood as the left ventricle is trying to pump blood out the aorta. That back leak ends up creating a heart murmur and we can start to develop secondary enlargement of the heart 
from that back leak across the mitral valve. Um, that's putting things in, in, in very simple terms at this point in time. Um, we can also see arrhythmias develop um, in the dog. There's a, a form of heart disease that primarily affects the boxer called arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And that involves a, a fatty infiltration into the, into the heart and creates secondary arrhythmias. And we can see that in some, some other breeds as well, like English bulldogs, pit bulls, those, those sorts. And then on the cat side, um, mostly cats develop heart muscle disease. So again, a cardiomyopathy. And there are three forms of, of cardiomyopathy in the cat, something we call hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the most common form of heart disease in the cat, affecting up to 16% of cats um, in their lifetime. And that involves a, a thickening of the heart muscle, in particular, the left ventricle. Um, the second type is called restrictive cardiomyopathy, and that involves a, a scar tissue infiltration into usually the left ventricle, sometimes the right ventricle. And then thirdly, we can see dilated cardiomyopathy in the cat. That's a very rare disease and usually is dietarily related. We used to see a tremendous amount back in the, in the 70s and early 80s until we figured out that cat food was deficient in an important protein or amino acid called taurine. And now mm -hmm. that cat foods are hyper supplemented with taurine, it's, it's very rare for us to see dilated cardiomyopathy, except in cats that might be on a, on a homemade diet or a vegan diet, something of that nature. Now, having said all this, um, in humans with coronary disease, there, there often is somewhat of a genetic component to coronary disease in people, but a lot of times it's lifestyle related. It's, it's eating lots of cheeseburgers, um, you know, sitting on the couch too much, lack of exercise that, that can cause increases in cholesterol and, and that leading to atherosclerosis or coronary disease. But in the dog and the cat, um, none of these diseases are, are lifestyle related. These are all genetics. Um, so there are many breeds and we'll talk here in a moment that may be more predisposed to certain diseases or the other, but um, most of the time in both cats and dogs, all of this is genetically related. Wow. Oh, okay. Uh, so the next question is like, what are some signs uh, that an owner should look out for that they would, you know, that would make you wonder if this is a heart issue? Sure. So in, in cats, cats are really difficult to read. Cats are, are interesting creatures. And, and for the most part, until cats have very, very late stage heart disease, they don't show any symptoms of heart disease. So until a cat actually goes into congestive heart failure, where the heart is failing as the pump that it might, that it's meant to be, and they end up accumulating fluid either in their chest or in their lungs, um, we don't see any symptoms. But in a, in a cat, you might see an increase in their breathing rate or their breathing effort. Um, cats may become more secluded or they may become more clingy, trying to tell you something going on. Um, very nonspecific sorts of symptoms in cats. Um, in the dog, it, it really depends on the dog. Many dogs, um, if they're anything like my two dogs, they spend a, a fair amount of time on the couch um, as opposed to being very active. But um, if a dog is, is lagging behind on walks, um, you know, telling you that they don't want to walk around the block any longer, or they get home from a walk and they're panting a whole lot and taking a, a tremendous amount of time to recover from that walk, um, that, may, that may be telling you that there's some early symptoms of heart disease. Very obvious things, your dog runs across the backyard after a squirrel or a deer and he ends up actually falling over and faints. Um, that's often secondary to, to heart disease. And um, one, one might think that, that those wouldn't be symptoms that are ignored, but a lot of people go, ah, it happened once, it's no big deal. But you should definitely, definitely talk to your primary care veterinarian if something like that happens. And then very obvious symptoms of congestive heart failure, again, when the heart's failing as, as the pump, um, dogs can accumulate pulmonary edema or fluid in their lungs. And that causes a lot of coughing, especially at rest. Um, a lot of people um, bring in their bringing their dog for complaints of, you know, coughing after exercise. With heart failure, we're, we're often more concerned about coughing at rest or an exacerbation of, of previous symptoms of coughing with exercise. But the one thing that you can monitor on your dog and or cat at home is their resting breathing rate. So when they're just sacked out on the couch or the floor of your bed, count the times they breathe in a minute. So a rise and a fall, 
their chest is one breath. And normal resting respiratory or resting breathing rate is less than 30 to 35 breaths per minute. So if you're seeing a persistent increase in that breathing rate, that's time that you should be getting your dog or cat to the to your to your veterinarian for them to be assessed. Okay, so um, when should a pet owner then consider bringing their pet if they suspect anything to a cardiovascular specialist or should they uh, directly to a cardiovascular specialist over let's say going to an internal medicine doctor? So, so that, that's, that's an interesting question. We always recommend that you start and work with your primary care veterinarian first. Okay. And everybody has a, a relationship established with their family primary care veterinarian and all veterinarians are, are equipped to at least diagnose a, a suspicion of heart disease. And a lot of the, the things that we find that will lead to a referral to a cardiologist um, like myself is your veterinarian may find a heart murmur. They may hear extra breath sounds, we term crackles within the chest with their stethoscope. Um, they may hear an abnormal or, or an irregular heart rhythm during their examination. And all these are, are physical exam findings that, that are very typical or at least highly suggestive of developing heart disease in the dog or cat. Um, that may lead your veterinarian to take a chest x-ray um, to see what the size of the heart looks like, to see if there's any, any infiltrates, things going on inside of the lungs. It may also lead them to, to do an electrocardiogram or an ECG, and that can tell us what type of electrical abnormality or arrhythmia is going on. And once your primary care veterinarian ends up determining that they have a high, high level of suspicion of heart disease, that's the time for, for them to, to make the call and say, hey, you should contact a cardiologist in your sure. neck of the woods and, and go, to, go to see them as a, as a secondary care. Very similar to, you know, if you were sort of short of breath going up the stairs at home yourself, you'd probably go see your, your primary care doctor, your internist, and he or she would then say, yeah, I think we're going to send you a cardiologist for further workup. So um, let's say, you know, uh, a pet owner has been referred to CVCA. Could you walk us through like what is your, uh, you know, uh, workup or process that one should expect uh, would get with their Absolutely. pet? Absolutely. So, so if, you're, if your doctor, your, your veterinarian had referred you to see CVCA, the, the first thing we do is review the history. Um, a lot we can actually glean from, from the history of what's been going on with your dog or cat. Uh, we may see that the drugs have been used by your veterinarian that did work or didn't work, and that can help us you know, go down a path. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of genetics that go on with heart disease in the dog or cat and simply certain breeds are much more predisposed to certain ailments over the other and that can lead us down, down a certain path. But in regard to diagnostics, really the gold standard of, of diagnostics in, in veterinary cardiology is the echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound or sonogram of the heart. And that allows us to, to look at the heart um, two-dimensionally in real time. And it allows us to, to measure out all the chambers of the heart, look at all the valves up close and personally, map out all the blood flow across the valve, see if a valve is leaking, see if a valve is not functioning correctly, see if the heart is not pumping adequately. And that, that diagnostic tool helps lead us to appropriate treatments that can hopefully improve the overall quality and longevity of, of your pet's life. Other things that, that we may end up doing, we, we may, may end up running a more sophisticated electrocardiogram or ECG. Um, we may end up having to repeat some chest x-rays depending on if your veterinarian had started a specific treatment to see if we see improvement in the lungs. Um, there are potentially some surgeries that, that can be done. Those are, are more reserved for, for some congenital defects. We, we're talking more about acquired heart disease as, as dogs or cats potentially get older. There are some congenital defects. Congenital means that your dog or cat was actually born with a defect of their heart. And that may involve an abnormal blood vessel that hadn't closed over, may involve a, a valve that wasn't formed correctly. And those types of, of congenital defects, we can actually oftentimes correct um, 
via surgery. Um, usually the surgery is, is what we term minimally interventional or minimally invasive, um, where we end up just catheterizing the heart with special, special catheters um, that can dilate balloons or close off blood vessels. Um, the other type of surgery that's commonly performed in, in veterinary cardiology, and my own dog actually has a pacemaker. If we have too slow of a heart rate and dogs are fainting from too slow of a heart rate, we can actually implant a pacemaker just like a human. And as I said, my, my own dog got one of those when he was tw 20 months old. He ended up in the right house, thankfully. That's, uh, um, I did not know CVCA did such uh, surgeries uh, also. I had no idea. Um, and so moving on to treatment options, other than surgery, are there any other treatment options uh, when diagnosed with these genetic uh, um, cardiac conditions? Absolutely. So we, we talked, you know, a little bit about surgery for cor correction of congenital defects. And in human medicine, a lot of times if, if you have, you know, coronary disease or you have a bad valve, you end up at a major hospital center, a un university or, or major, major hospital center like ANOVA around here. Um, and surgery, the, the surgeon's, you know, credo is, is to cut is to cure. Um, and in veterinary cardiology, we don't necessarily have the benefit of, of significant surgical intervention. Um, there's really only two centers in the world, one in England, one in Japan, that are doing primary valve repair under cardiopulmonary bypass. Hopefully it's gonna to come to the United States. Um, we've tried to attract some, some individuals to our practice to hopefully start a, an open heart uh, surgery center, but to this day, nothing is available in the United States. So that leads us to medication. And 99.9% .9 of, of what we do at CBCA Cardiac Care for Pets involves medication. And there are lots of great drugs that, that help treat heart disease that can certainly help prolong your, your pet's both quality and length of life. The, the ideal is that we do detect these, these heart situations much earlier be, before these pets become you know, very sick with heart disease, meaning that they've gone into congestive heart failure. We can do a lot more with early intervention, and that's why it's, it's of utmost importance that you see your veterinarian, your primary care veterinarian, at least once a year for an annual checkup. And when your pets are over the age of seven or eight, every six months. Um, mm -hmm. I, as we all know, our pets age a lot quicker than we do, and these, these disease processes can develop you know, pretty quickly, especially as they're getting older. So these, these annual visits or biannual visits are of utmost important in early detection of heart disease. So, but when we do end up with a patient that has, you know, early or moderate heart disease, they've yet to go into congestive heart failure. Um, the most common, common drug that we use in the canine um, is a drug called Pimobendin. Um, the name brand is Vetmedin produced by Beringer Ingelheim. Um, that drug has been shown to delay the onset of heart failure um, by 15 months um, compared to that of a placebo. And that 15 months is in addition to the normal time that your dog wouldn't have been exhibiting symptoms. So it's a very, very beneficial drug when instituted at the appropriate time um, in, in a dog with degenerative valve disease. Um, other drugs that we use are, are mostly human drugs. We actually use a tremendous amount of, of human medication outside of the medication called Pimobendin. And we end up working with pharmacists just like Jay um, that can either produce these drugs in a compounded formulation in a smaller size or that can prescribe it right off the shelf. Um, but probably 90%, you know, outside of Pimobendin are, are medications that are human drugs that we can prescribe to a, a you know, a typical pharmacy in, in your neighborhood. Um, these drugs sometimes are blood pressure medications, sometimes they're diuretics that, that help pull fluid out of the body. Um, we use drugs that help control the heart rhythm. If, if the heart rhythm is too fast or too slow, there are drugs that can help control that. Um, for the most part, these, these drugs are, are handled very well by, by the dog or cat. Um, some of these drugs can have rare, and I stress rare, interactions with the liver or kidney. And a lot of times we do need you to follow up with your primary care veterinarian two or three weeks after starting these drugs, just to make sure your dog or cat is not suffering from one of these very rare interactions. But for the most part, um, these, these drugs are tolerated quite well. 
Okay. Now you had mentioned a little bit about breeds. Um, are there any certain breeds that just have a higher incidence of heart disease? Sure. So on the, on the feline or cat side of things, um, the Maine Coon cat, um, of which I have three, um, are, is sort of the poster child for the most common type of heart disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that involves a thickening of the heart muscle. Other breeds that are affected by that are, are, are ragdolls, uh, sphinxes, Bengals, sometimes Persian Himalayans, um, but the, the Maine Coon, Sphinx, and, and uh, ragdoll tend to be the most commonly affected with that disease. Now, having said that, um, we don't see too many purebred cats. Um, the most common cat we see is the domestic short hair, domestic long hair, um, you know, sort of our classic, you know, tabby cat that's out there. And, and all of those cats are, are definitely prone to, to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well. Now on the canine side of things, um, for large breed dogs, those dogs tend to develop what I, what I mentioned before, dilated cardiomyopathy, and that involves an enlargement of the heart and usually a decrease in the overall function or, or degree of pumping action or contractility of the heart. Um, the Doberman Pinscher is the, the poster, poster dog, poster child for that type of disease, but many other large breeds of dogs are, are definitely predisposed to that. Um, my research breed of interest, the Irish Wolfhound, develops a, a uh, an atypical form of, of dilated cardiomyopathy where just their left atrium tends to be primarily affected and they all develop um, atrial fibrillation secondary to that, that disease process. Other large breeds of dogs, Great Danes, um, Mastiffs, um, sort of across the board are, are also genetically predisposed to dilated cardiomyopathy. And then when we talk about the degenerative valve disease, a, a degeneration of the, the mitral valve from a genetic standpoint, um, the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, uh, the Chihuahua, um, Cocker Spaniels, Schnauzer, Shih Tzus, Lhasa Apsos, um, all of the, the small breeds, the toy breeds, um, all of them are very, very predisposed to this. And, and you know, it's reported up to about 90% of small breeds at one point in time are going to develop some form of degenerative valve disease. Now, the question is whether they develop significant enough disease that needs medicine and could potentially shorten their, their longevity. Um, that's when we, we do need to get involved as a cardiologist to determine the appropriate time or not to start medication to slow the process down. And Dr. Tyrell, like overall, kind of like humans, um, can pets live a normal life uh, or does the heart disease kind of shorten their lifespan um, at all? It, it really depends. Um, you know, I, I won't kid you. There, there are certainly, you know, cases that, that are very severe and aggressive that, that very sadly do, do shorten the, the longevity of, of a cat or a dog's life. Um, however, as I mentioned previously, early detection of heart disease is, is really paramount. Um, so seeing your primary care veterinarian for annual or biannual exams, and if they're starting to hear um, anything with a stethoscope, or you're starting to see symptoms at home that could be indicative of heart disease, and the earlier we can get them in to see us, the, the better we can do. But on average, you know, if we see a, a dog or a cat that comes in in congestive heart failure, which usually means they have fairly late stage disease, the prognosis from that point in time, and again, I stress this is highly variable, um, is usually about 12 months to two years of, of time. Um, I do emphasize that, that during that period of time, that's good quality of life. Um, the medicines um, that we can use you know, are, are tolerated well and you know, provide these patients a great deal of relief with, with breathing, with strengthening their heart muscle, with increasing their exercise capacity, exercise capacity and you know, having a great home life for that period of time. Now, uh, with that treatment that you just mentioned, are there any other like nutritional diet recommendations that you get, uh, you recommend also? Sure. Thank you for mentioning that, Jay. Um, so, so there there are certainly some supplements that we can consider. Um, Omega three fatty acids or fish oils are, are often uh, prescribed. Omega three fatty acids um, have been 
potentially shown to prolong survivability. Once patients are in heart failure, they've been shown to, to decrease weight loss or what we term cardiac cachexia uh, in dogs that have, have, have gone into congestive heart failure. They've also been shown to potentially be antiarrhythmic. Um, so they may help control some, some bad arrhythmias. Um, there are some, some protein building blocks called amino acids, one called taurine, another called L-carnitine. A lot of times in, in large breed dogs that are, are affected by dilated cardiomyopathy, we recommend supplementation with those, those supplements as well. Um, as it pertains to diet, and this is, this is a little bit of a, of a hot potato issue, but over the past two and a half years, about two and a half years ago, the FDA put out a warning regarding the feeding of grain-free diets um, that may potentially contribute to the development of dilated cardiomyopathy. About three years ago or so um, across the country, um, our, our group included, we started noticing breeds of dogs, like, like small breeds of dogs that were developing dilated cardiomyopathy which was very, very atypical. And as I mentioned previously, uh, most of the time this is genetically related. So a few very astute people made the connection that these dogs were being fed grain-free diets, these sort of very boutique diets. Um, and the FDA got involved and they had made the connection that most of these diets had high contents of legumes um, or they had a very novel protein. Um, instead of chicken or beef or pork, um, they might have had alligator or kangaroo or uh, mystery whitefish, um, mm. things like that. Um, so the FDA, uh, along with CBCA, uh, did do a study. Um, the results are, 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 are still somewhat pending, um, but we are still seeing dogs today that are developing dilated cardiomyopathy that are on grain-free diets. So at this point in time, we, we do recommend unless your dog um, is being fed a novel protein diet, um, you know, for allergies, gastrointestinal allergies or skin allergies, um, that you consider feeding a, a grain containing diet. And again, there, there, there is controversy over this. You know, some people say dogs don't need grain. Um, dogs are omnivores. They're just like us. Um, they, they, they are fine to be eating grain. Um, even wolves or coyotes that are out there in, in, in the wilderness, they're eating plant-based grains. Um, so dogs are omnivores. They, they, they are fine to be being fed grain. Um, the, the big thing though, is to, to, if your dog is being fed a grain-free diet, ideally, um, change it over to a, a mainstream diet. I'm not going to mention any, any name brands of foods to avoid any controversy, but, um, most of the diets that you've heard of for years and years that potentially you can even get at the grocery store or on the front shelves of, of our major, you know, pet food markets are, are the diets that, that we do recommend as, as veterinarians. Um, those large pet food companies have spent literally billions of dollars on pet food research, um, compared to some of these boutique brands, um, that don't even have a veterinary nutritionist on staff. Um, the other difference between these large pet food companies is they've actually done feed trialing. Um, and that's where the billions of dollars come in to, to see what the food does over the period of the, the life of, of these dogs. So bottom line, when it comes to, to diet, um, we do recommend avoiding these grain-free diets until more research comes out as to to why some dogs develop dilated cardiomyopathy that are fed grain-free diets and others have been on the whole life and they've never developed dilated cardiomyopathy. So much is unknown, but um, it's kind of one of those things. If, if you've smoked cigarettes your whole life, you should probably still quit because there's still a risk <laughs> um, of, of bad things happening. Um, and then when it comes to, to um, other diets, if a dog or cat goes into congestive heart failure, um, we are still recommending, you know, one of these high quality uh, major pet food brand uh, names, but we typically recommend a, a, a modified or, or moderated amount of sodium. And most of the time, most of our, our mature or geriatric um, brands or, or, or 
age levels of, of dog food or cat food are appropriate sodium levels. And it really transmits into uh, not giving them hot dogs or cured meats, things like that at home. Um, no Chinese food, things that would contain a tremendous amount of salt that can potentially upset the apple card in our balance and treatment of congestive heart failure. Well, I'm glad we touched on that uh, about the diet. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that information. Surely. Well, Dr. Tyrell, um, you have shared a lot of information and thank you very much for joining us. Now, how could someone reach out to you? Sure. So, so my primary practice, as mentioned uh, at the onset of this podcast, is, is at uh, out of the Life Center. Our um, phone number is 703-669-9311. Um, or our email address is cvcaleesburg at cvcavets.com. I'll make sure to put the contact information in the show notes. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning into the Compounding Center Connections podcast. We hope you found the information presented today to be useful. If you have any comments or questions, please reach out to me at j at compoundingcenter.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast channel, The Compounding Center Connections, and stay tuned for future episodes. Thank you, Dr. Tyrell. Thank you, Jay. Very much appreciate it. Take care now. Thanks. Thanks.